And so that's when this idea clicked for me personally, which was there's this gravity towards the web and the web browser. I noticed that my wife wouldn't leave Chrome all day, even though she wasn't in the tech world. And so combining watching my wife use Chrome on her laptop with at work seeing that the up and coming next generation companies were all web apps in the browser had this insight of, well, what about the web browser itself? That Chrome thing, that shell around it hasn't changed in a long time. So the idea was, let's incubate the company at Thrive. This is going to be kind of a business productivity tool. And I'm not a business productivity tool person. So we'll go find co-founders and we'll give it a business capital and we'll help it get off the ground. And, and, and then it'll be off like any other company. And so I called my former co-founder and CTO, Hirsch, because again, it was like, if I'm going to do this, I should do it with people I love. And I should give this idea to someone I love. Hirsch agreed to be the co-founder and CTO. We started looking for a CEO and co-founder and then COVID hit and everything changed after that. Welcome to The Peel, where we explore the world's greatest startup stories. I'm your host, Turner Novak, founder of Nand Capital, the venture capital firm that also changed after COVID hit. I'm excited to share my conversation with Josh Miller. Josh is the co-founder and CEO of The Browser Company, maker of the popular web browser, Arc. We get started with the browser company's unique founding story, including how Josh joined Thrive Capital after working in the Obama administration, why Josh wasn't originally the CEO, why Josh Kushner at Thrive gave Josh Miller most of Thrive's equity when he joined a CEO, how COVID made browsers relevant again, and the story behind Arc Search, which could jumpstart the company's second act. Josh also shares why he's building a web browser, the reasons people use Arc, how we'll make money, why growing distribution is its existential problem, and inside the strategy of building in public on YouTube. I found one of Josh's skills is team building, and we go deep on his secrets to hiring a great team, how he learned to delegate, and why praising your team publicly is so important. This is an awesome conversation on all things product, hiring, and company strategy. I want to give a thank you to Freya Lobo, Antoine Martin, Josh Lee, Ellis Hamburger, and Terrence Rohan for suggesting great questions for Josh that all led to an amazing conversation. Without further ado, here's Josh Miller. Josh, how's it going? Welcome to the show. Good. Thank you for having me, Turner. So you have a super interesting background. I think the most exciting thing or most interesting thing for the audience pre-browser company that you've done, you were the head of product for the Obama administration. I didn't even know that that type of role could exist. Like, What does that even mean, (laughs) head of product for a president? Yeah, it was a very fun role, but the title definitely sounds more grandiose than it was. Basically, my a mentor of mine and the board member at my first company got hired by President Obama to essentially create this new office in the White House called Office of Digital Strategy. And within that, they put anything on the internet, everything from the website and the social media accounts all the way to citizen services that Americans rely on every day through the internet to get what they need from the government. And that was a lot of products. And my old boss came to me and said, actually, I think I may have even got a him and like got an internship, like got a job. And he was gracious enough to create this position that was essentially responsible for the sort of things that you think a product manager would do in the private sector, but thinking about it from the perspective of the White House and the US government, really. So it ended up being a lot of really little, big, projects across these different properties and products, but it was just so cool to be in the physical White House for the last two years of administration. So that was definitely the coolest bit. Our mutual friend, Antoine Martin from Zenly Ammo, he said that you gave up a very significant amount. I think it was unvested stock in your previous employer to make the jump in. So that's like a pretty crucial decision. Like, How did you decide to make that? Like, Why did you do it? I I respect this about our government and the White House. They have a really strict ethics policy. So I had a lot from our acquisition and the government makes you sell it. So you don't have any kind of biases or public stock. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. I mean, it really was for the life experience. We got, I got to go to Camp David. I got to be on the South Lawn when the Pope came. I just these, these kind of these priceless life experiences and to be around the people I got to be. So in retrospect, it was definitely, it's definitely going to go down as the, most dumb financial decision I will have ever made in my life. But, um, <laughs> and I feel, pri- again, a lot of privilege to know that coming out of the White House, I felt confident that I was going to be able to get a well paying job. And so I was fortunate in that, right? So not complaining, but yeah, it definitely was not a wise 
purely financial decision, but the life experiences were fantastic. Yeah. And you were still, were you still in your twenties, like late, late twenties or early, early twenties, actually. So I'm 33 now. And at the time sold the company, we sold the company when we were 22. So it's probably 25, 25, 24. Yeah. So again, head of products, director of products, made up title. I was very, very early in my career. So maybe you can think about it as like an MBA. It was a learning experience. You know, you gave up a lot, but it was like once in a lifetime in your 20s. Very few people probably got that experience at that point in their life. Yeah. And in many ways, I think of it almost like a, it was a liberal arts education in a lot of ways. So, I, you know, at that point, I'd, I'd kind of been blasted into this tech world while still in college and, and didn't really know anything else. And all of a sudden I was working on an affordable diaper program that was all about distribution to low income communities of diapers without markups at local bodegas, all the way to kind of the opioid epidemic task force and around people that had only spent their life thinking about education policy. And so for me, it was, I, w- I wouldn't really call it an MBA as much as uh, breaking out of the tech world and you know being around people that were inspired by and motivated by and experts on all these topics that I only got to read about in the newspaper. So that it really changed my career in a lot of ways for that reason until up until that point I thought of myself you know to Antoine as a consumer social social media guy that's what my identity was and of course I was 22 23 24 I didn't know really who I was and the white house experience really reminded me that at my core I'm not really a tech guy I'm much more interested in in the people behind all of this and and so the white house was almost like a not only learning about these topics from these people, but also learning about myself in that way of, wait a minute, like, what do I actually care about at the end of the day? Yeah. What did you think you learned about yourself? The thing that at the time was very concerning is too strong a word, but definitely challenged my own conception of what I wanted, especially professionally. And later was really freeing was at that point, I thought my mission in life was social media. You know, I was this very idealistic and ignorant kid who th- thought I wanted to be the next Mark Zuckerberg or whatever, as embarrassed as I am to say that now. And that experience at the White House taught me that I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I wasn't really sure what topic or theme I wanted to work on. And in fact, I was having just as much fun working on the opioid epidemic task force as I was the affordable diaper program, as I was the IRS on their way that we pay taxes digitally. And there was basically no commonality between those themes or projects. So it actually made me leave the White House with basically no sense of what I wanted. Did I want to work in tech at all? If within tech, did I want to make a company? Did I want to serve? I just, it really discombobulated my, this kind of trajectory I thought I was on, this path I thought I was on, which actually is what led me to my job after that at Thrive Capital, was this lack of any understanding professionally of what the heck I wanted from my career, which was in retrospect, very empowering and led me to where I am today. But in the moment, it sort of, knocked me off this path that I thought I was on and this sense of who I was that I thought I had. Okay. I definitely want to lead into that, the next thing that you did, but I didn't want to miss this question because it was a it was a, a highly requested question from our friend Fria Lobo. Uh oh Fria. Yeah. Fr- Fria said, what browser do you think Barack Obama uses? Fria. <laughs> definitely not ARC, unfortunately. That'd be really awesome, but he doesn't definitely does not use ARC. Not a sidebar guy. I would guess Safari. He's a cool, classy, sophisticated, privacy-minded individual. So my, my bet is Safari and probably on his phone. I wonder if President Obama touches a laptop these days. I kind of hope not. But I, my, my bet is Safari wherever he is. Is that like a, like a status thing is not having to use a laptop or like a, you've made it in life is... I mean, as someone who runs a desktop web browser company, I, I hope not. But I, I, I mean, to be honest, we just recently released this, our first real mobile browser. And one of the reasons we did that is we had this realization that none of us on the team used Arc at all on vacations or the weekends. I mean, at all is strong language. But effectively, when we didn't need to be at work, we didn't ourselves want to touch our computer, especially as streaming services have moved to, or TVs have had, you know, are are now mostly smart and have Netflix apps on them. And for certain people, iPads have become an entertainment device system. We just weren't really using our laptops. So I imagine, I I have this image of President Obama flying around the world and meeting world leaders and playing golf and hanging with his family and and not on a like multi-screen setup with Arc loaded up, but who knows? Yeah, that's fair. So you you talked about the thing that you did next after 
Obama administration. What was that? And it's kind of a unique transition. How did that come about? Yeah, so I was one of the, again, I, the, the White House was an experience of working on a broad portfolio of projects where there are lots of really talented experts. And I would come in and try to play this really tiny role as it related to technology. And one of those projects was a recidivism project with the Department of Justice, which was essentially once people are incarcerated in the federal prison system, there's actually a really high rate of those individuals coming back into the prison system. And so the project was what sort of skills and education or programming can we provide to inmates through the internet while they're in prison to prevent recidivism, which is a topic that is near and dear to Josh Kushner's heart because his father spent some time in prison. And Josh does a lot of kind of nonprofit advocacy work. And so he actually, I worked with him on a project in the Obama White House related to recidivism. And as the, I was a political appointee, which means whoever won, I was going to be out of a job at the end of the administration. And Josh reached out, I think probably sensing that I had no idea what I wanted to do, saying, why don't you come hang out at Thrive for a year? I, I don't, we can make up a title. We'll give you a little bit of a salary so you don't have to worry about it. And why don't you just spend a year shadowing board meetings, shadowing our partner meetings, meeting with people you find interesting, just like take your time. And if you come out starting a nonprofit, fantastic. At the time, I had this idea of doing a Y Combinator for nonprofits and, and civic technology organizations. That was, so that was my spiel at the time. And so it was like, whether you do that, that's great. If you start another company, that's great. If you want to be an investor, that could be great too. We do that at Thrive and had this kind of generous offer. So came up with an EIR title, Entrepreneur Residence, which was, I guess, silly titles is a kind of like part of my career path so far. So we all make titles to... No, you're totally right. The title it just it inflates our sense of yeah. As you go on, you realize it doesn't matter. But I had a blast spending a year at Thrive. Just again, kind of trying to replicate what I had in the White House of learning about a bunch of different things at once. But at, at Thrive. So then, how did the browser company come about? You were at Thrive when you kind of you incubated it. Is that a fair thing to say? Yeah. So how did it come about? And then I'm super curious, just like how Thrive incubates companies. Is that a common thing? One off? So one twist to the story is so I was an entrepreneur in residence for one year. And the idea was at the end of that year, I would know what I wanted to do with my career. And that year came due and I had even less idea of what I wanted to do. <laughs> All like nothing, nothing panned out. And I was less, I had, I had like, if the White House was going downhill, it was going downhill at the end of the one year at Thrive in terms of my sense of what I wanted to do with my career. And Josh made the pitch of maybe you should just be an investor here. And his, his appeal was... We, we invest in companies and we invest in companies across stages, but we also start companies. We incubated Oscar Health, as you mentioned, and, and others. So by joining Thrive, you can, you can keep your options open in terms of starting companies and investing companies, even if the way you start them is a little bit different. And so I actually joined Thrive as a full-time investor. Uh, and I was there for two years. And towards the end of my tenure there, it was a period in our industry that you'll remember where everyone was talking about Notion and Airtable, and Figma, and GitHub, and uh, you know Thrive when I was there led Airtables, I believe it was Series B. And what was so fascinating to me at the time was my career had started in this era of mobile social. <laughs> mobile social, even I uh, hate to say it, remember mobile social local? That was the beginning of my career. And so to be at this top tier investment fund, looking at the hottest deals and air quotes in Silicon Valley, and they were all desktop web apps for work was bizarre, especially because I was, it was the first, I remember the first time, that's not true. The first time I saw Notion, I thought it was just like hipster Google Docs. And I didn't get what the fuss was about, but maybe the third or fourth time I really gave it a shot. I hadn't been that inspired by the blocks and nested pages since I used Snapchat for the first time. And so that's when this idea clicked for me personally, which was there's this gravity towards the web and the web browser. I noticed that my wife wouldn't leave Chrome all day, even though she wasn't in the tech world. She wouldn't use Chrome, leave Chrome all day because even on the tech world, all the tools she needed were in the web browser. And so combining watching my wife use Chrome on her laptop with at work seeing that the kind of the up and coming next generation companies were all web apps in the browser had this insight of well, what about the web browser itself? That Chrome thing, that shell around it hasn't changed in a long time. So the idea was, let's incubate the company at Thrive. This is going to be kind of 
business productivity tool and I'm not a business productivity tool person. So we'll go find co-founders and we'll give it a business capital and we'll help it get off the ground and, and, and then it'll be off like any other company. And so I called my co former co-founder and a CTO Hirsch because again, it was like, if I'm going to do this, I should do it with people I love and I should give this idea to someone I love. Hirsch agreed to be the co-founder and CTO. We started looking for a CEO and co-founder and then COVID hit and everything changed after that. But that, that essentially was the trajectory from working at Thrive, investing at Thrive, noticing this trend, uh, having the idea for a browser company, having an idea for a browser for work and for enterprises, not for me, but I'll go give it to my friend and then COVID changes everything. Wow. There's a, a lot of different directions we can go based on what you just said. I think the one I don't want to miss is it's called the Browser Company of New York. That is the name of the company. I, I think it's like the top five coolest company name ever. Like I tweeted this a couple of weeks ago. I was like, this is such a just like, it's an awesome name just because it's so unique and bold and, and long and it's just different. What's the story of the name? The honest, I really want there to be a cool story. And I know that the other people that were there will will remember it. And I'm sure it is cool. I can't remember, but I do remember why we picked it. I cannot, I cannot remember who came up with it, when they came up with it, like what the motivation was. But I remember the reason we picked it was at the time in Silicon Valley, it felt like everyone was coming up with these words, like these names like Notion, Airtable that were, they were just kind of perfect. And they were kind of smart and they were kind of trying to be their own phrases. Like it was good naming. And, and, and a lot of, if you think about a lot of things, even we do today, it's about inversion and it's about doing, not doing what you expect from a web browser, which is boring and not a, you don't think of it as a consumer piece of software, et cetera, et cetera. And so I know regardless of the origin, origin story of it, why we picked it was that it's not what you expect from a Silicon Valley startup. And that it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's absolutely patently absurd, absurd, because it also takes itself kind of seriously if you think about what it's referential to. But at the end of the day, we were this group of people in New York City that were proud to be in New York City. So it, that, it was it was that combination of inversion and not taking itself too seriously, combined with the fact that we were just really proud to be building the company in New York. Yeah, and I think you officially have part of it like italicized, kind of like in. Like this special, we lean into it. We're just like, let's just make it feel like, let's make it feel like one day there'll be like a marble office tower with gargoyles on it. Like, what would that version of logo be? Like, just own it. And so, uh, a gentleman named Willem came up with the actual logo itself. And to be honest, he did it once. We haven't changed it since. And yeah, it just was one of those things that just kind of it just felt right when you saw it. So yeah, those are the best. I mean, my logo for. Banana Capital for the podcast, like my website. I did them once, never changed them. Maybe that's not the right move. I probably should. Like when I look at my website, you would objectively say that is a very, I don't know if bad is the right word, but there's room to improve. I, I like the just like clinging to tra- tradition, just keeping the thing that you started with. For sure. And I think that authenticity stands out and it is it feels fresh, I think at least now. Or at least that's how we, that's how we even we approach the, Try to approach the YouTube stuff is what do you expect from corporate comms, and then how do we invert it? So you see, you'll see that you see that pattern a lot with the things that we do. Yeah, and then that's a really really interesting point. The YouTube thing, I definitely we're going to hit on that in a second for sure. I think that you guys do a really interesting job with that. But you mentioned COVID hit. I think this was roughly based on LinkedIn, like six months into kind of officially starting this. What happened when when COVID hit? Well, so again, there were, I think there were almost like two start dates. There was when we incubated the company, when it was just Hirsch, and it was really an R&D project. It was, how does one build a browser? Technically, it's just really understanding the market and starting to build out the founding team. And that was in, call it August or September of 2019. And then as Hirsch and the first engineer, Samir, started prototyping, that's when we realized, oh, wait, this is actually a consumer product. Because at the time, we'd been thinking of it as, as almost enterprise software, as work productivity software we'd sell to companies. And then we realized, like, well, actually, the web browser is one of the most consumer pieces of software, maybe the most, in that if you were to think about the software that your mom, your niece, and you use, what's at the middle of the Venn diagram? There's not a ton. You know, your, your mom probably doesn't use the social media tools that your niece uses. Uh, your niece probably doesn't use a calendar. And so 
you know, certain messaging apps, depending on the, co- the country you're in, the camera app, you know, web browsers, one of the most consumer pieces of software. And you need it across your work and personal life. But people didn't, don't think of it like that and didn't think about it like that. And we didn't think about it like that. And so the moment that we realized from prototype, like, well, we're going to use this across our entire life. That's when I started to get really excited about it personally and started to get a little jealous that they got to work on it every day. And I had to go to these like pitch meetings with founders at the time. So that was when like the idea of maybe do I come as a co-founder started. And that's like January of 2020. So ish around February, decide to join. And then two weeks before the COVID lockdowns in New York happened, I joined as an official co-founder, had left Thrive. We had an office space, one floor under Thrive in the same building. The founding team was together. And then poof, the browser company of New York became a remote company, distributed company. And, you know, we've really been ever since. So is that probably the biggest impact that COVID had was just forcing you to kind of be remote from the, the founding date? The biggest impact that COVID had was it pulled forward people's understanding why the browser was important and broken. So keep in mind, even to this day, the question we tend to get is, why should I care about my browser? Do I care about my browser? What is my browser? Why is my browser not fine? You know, people don't really have an opinion about it in the way they have, might have an opinion about their iPhone versus an Android, for example. COVID changed that. It was, it was like a quintessential tailwinds you got lucky, which were all of a sudden everybody's office was Chrome and a bunch of tabs because they weren't in person and they weren't in a meeting room and they were on Zoom and they were in their existential, are we going to do a fig jam dance? <laughs> And that was in that was in their web browser, and so I think actually that that was the biggest impact of COVID was culturally almost like, you know, I th- a thing we talk about internally is what would stand up comedians make fun of in a skit? We should build f- software and features for those moments on the internet. I think a stand up comedian never would have made fun of browser tabs or browsers before COVID. And then that became the butt of almost all jokes, browsers, Zoom, how horrible it was, how dystopian it was. So that kind of cultural impact was probably the, the, the biggest thing from COVID. I think the second thing that is worth noting is in retrospect, I think if you were to ask 10 people in our industry about the browser company, one of the first three things and not the first thing they'd say is they've built an amazing team. I don't think everyone likes their product. I don't think everyone gets their business model. I think there are a lot of things people would have varying degrees of confidence or clarity on. But I think most people would say, wow, they built an all-star crew. In retrospect, we would have not been able to build that high quality of a team if we weren't distributed and we wouldn't have been distributed. So that was a total accident. Again, we were planning on just being in New York. But if you look at who are the people on our team that have had a huge impact on this company, a lot are in New York because that's where we got started. But a lot are in Montreal and India and Warsaw and all over the world. One big point I really wanted to dig into is you built a really good team. Like you said, how? Everyone wants to. Easier said than done. Two things come to mind. One is to really, really care. So keep in mind, this was my second company. I'd had some professional success up until that point. And the main reason actually that I wanted to join the browser company as an official co-founder was to work with Hershey again. And I think I'd realized again, I remember I'd been soul searching for what is the idea I want to work on, what industry, and I had no luck and I was at the declining luck. And so really what it was, was, okay, if I just accept there are a lot of things that make me excited and interested. And so it's hard to pick. Why don't I just follow the humans? Because that actually is when I look back on what I was most nostalgic for previous periods of my career, it was actually the crew I was with and certain individuals. And so the founding story of the browser company was really wanting to work with Hirsch. And that carried through to the first 10 people we hired was we, we tended to hire people that one of us had collected or picked up at some point in our career and just always said, ah, if I ever get to work with them again, I'll be so happy. So I think the first, it sounds cheesy and cliche, but it's true. It's just really, really caring about the team and building the team. And I, I, yeah, I don't know how to, yeah, that's just very authentic to us. I think the second thing, I just had lunch with someone actually, and they said something pretty funny. Out of nowhere, they were, they were talking about how much tennis they play. I was like, oh, I'd love to play tennis. Uh, I'm not that good. And he's like, I'm really good. And I just kind of giggled because most people wouldn't just be like, yeah, I'm really good at tennis. And what he said is like, look, I'm, I think it's weird when people are falsely humble, you know, if they know that they're good at something. So just as a heads up, I'm good at tennis. I think I'm good at hiring. 
I think I'm good at spotting talent. I think I'm horrible at a lot of things, but one of the things I've just always had a knack for is identifying people that have something special. And so a great example of this is someone like Josh Lee, who I think a lot of people probably think of the browser company's videos or storytelling, and it's it's a team and and Nash runs it. And it's a it's a lot of people, but it, you know, at least when it comes to the video products, this video editor named Josh Lee is is really at the core. Josh Lee was a design intern at Facebook when I was there to DM me to go on a walk and get a coffee when he was you know probably a sophomore in college doing design, and just from that thirty minute walk, I was like this kid is something special. He came to intern for me at the White House uh, as a designer and then later broke into And anyways, long story short, he ends up at the browser company, but that kind of started with just feeling like, all right, I, I don't know this UPenn undergrad who's you know 19 years old. Just I don't know why. I just, I'm just pulled to him. So again, I'm not perfect. It's not all about me. And I think at this point, I have very little to do with how incredible our hiring is. But in the like foundational days, since a lot of people on this podcast are probably early stage founders, really caring, and then just really trusting your taste and intuition for for people who are special and kind of ignoring ignoring traditional credentials in a lot of ways. I think. Yeah. So really care. Find the people that you think are very talented, regardless of you know prior experience. Yeah, and I think the other thing about you know I realize now just owning that I think I'm really good and have good taste for the recruiting is be honest if you don't. And compliment yourself. So when I think about Hirsch as a two-time co-founder, I think the biggest difference between me as a second-time co-founder and a first-time co-founder is being comfortable in my own skin and just being really self-aware about what am I exceptional at and own it and run towards it and what am I not and really overcompensate and hire and delegate for those things. Because as a first-time founder, especially a young founder, you feel like you need to be Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg, these mythical characters, which you're just not. And yeah, so I think I think that would be my advice in the second bit is if you have good taste in people and you know if you do, and if you're good at getting people really excited about what you're excited about, then lean into that. And if you're not, get someone on your founding team who is because it is essential and the best at it are really good at it. And you want somebody who's the best at it on your team, whether it's you or someone else. And so I, I, I had to compensate for my weaknesses in other ways, but I think recruiting talent has always been a strength of mine. Yeah, and that's true. When you think about just those two examples, Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, like Sheryl Sandberg kind of did a lot on the business side, right? Like the revenue model, the, all that kind of stuff. And with Steve Jobs, like he didn't set up the supply chain to like build all these phones. Like that wasn't him. And you need people that know how to do that. Yes, the Macintosh was Steve Wozniak. You know, in many ways, that's what you learn when you're at the beginning of your career. You you read the bio, right? And you see the social network. And then anyone that has some experience, you realize, all right, everybody is imperfect. Everyone's got strengths and weaknesses. Anything great happened with a team and not because you're supposed to say that, but because it's true. And so I think you just get more comfortable just like... So I'd say if I could tell my 20-year-old found, first-time founder self something, it'd be like... Relax. It's okay to be bad at things. It's okay to be spiky. It's just try to just be more honest with yourself about who you are and what you're exceptional at and not. And that's great. And just compliment yourself in the ways that you know you're not fantastic and just be self-aware. Was there a certain moment when you kind of realized like you went from this, I need to do it all, you know, I need to be good at everything, fill all these roles, to, you know, maybe I should kind of let go of some things, learn to delegate, trust other people. Yeah, I don't think there was a moment, but I think one of the big experience, keep in mind, like I was a sociology major with a C grade average that was hopping around internships each summer in college and then accidentally found myself in tech because of a sociology professor and then accidentally ended up starting a company because of a summer hackathon and I didn't know what a hack. So it was all like I just found myself in this industry as a founder. And then I got to Facebook when they acquired or acquired our first company. And Facebook at the time was exceptionally staffed and ex executed. Ex I mean, this was at peak Facebook when, I, when, we, when we joined in terms of the perception in the industry, where the top talent went, how the company was doing. And I did not fit in with the other PMs. Like I was, I was and am just cut from a different clock in Facebook product managers. And 
that was an eye-opening experience because at that point, I was probably a little bit too confident about my own sensibilities or gifts as a product person. Well, yeah, because you were just acquired by Facebook. I was acquired by Facebook and I was 22 years old. Like, I, And again, I, I have a lot of PTSD from the way I held myself at that period of my career. But you know, I, I was at least showing up at Facebook feeling like I have something to offer, something unique to offer. And then looking around at this company, it was the top of the top. I definitely was like, I have a lot to learn. And it was so diametrically opposed to how I thought about the world. I think that experience really taught me at the very least, there is not a single way to do things. And I think it's that, you know, I think that is an also a progression of my career and just life in general is think about things very binary at the beginning of your career. If there's a right or a long wrong way, or if I just listen to Turner's podcast, I'll know exactly how to do it. And I think you should listen to Turner's podcast, but the further you get and the more people you listen to, you're like, man, everyone's got a lot of ideas about how to do things. And like, they're all really successful. And I actually found that very empowering and, and, and eye-opening. And it kind of, I think some of the teams, the team building, like you, you spend so much time with your team. It kind of reminds me of the way you talked about the browser. You spend all your time in the browser. It's like with the teams, like you spend all your time building the company with the team. So, you know, you spend eight hours, 10, 12, 16 hours a day with those people. It's the most important thing. Yeah, it's funny. Turner. I had never made that connection, but I think you're spot on about, about it. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm embarrassed I'd ever thought about that, but I do think, actually, this has been on my mind. My godfather, who unfortunately just passed away, was very dear to me. He was an urban planner. He was the director, among other things, director of urban planning for Los Angeles and city manager of Culver City. And I grew up getting driven around Los Angeles by him and him like waxing poetic about like the, the, the streets and the neighborhoods and the parks and the zoning that is where we actually live our lives and is our perception of our world. And it was very formative in me wanting to go work on the internet and for software. And I do think there's a through line there where there was like my upbringing with him who's been on my mind a lot recently to wanting to focus on who I spend my time with more than what I do to being interested in this category of software because we spend so much time in it is there's probably a like quality of life and maybe or a selfish selfishness in terms of just like living my life in the way that I want. But there's some through line there that I had never thought about that you're absolutely right in terms of uh, time spent and quality of life and ensuring that we really, we really try the best. And yeah, I don't know. I, I have to think about that. That really struck me. Awesome. Glad I could contribute something <laughs> out of this. <laughs> one, the one takeaway from this whole thing. Yeah, I didn't think the banana podcast was going to get all existential, but now I'm feeling very emotional. So it's great. <laughs> hey, well, I mean, I got to differentiate somehow. This is how I, this is, this is my job to be done. This is what I stand for. So, well, so another really interesting thing, just in terms of like, like building the team, setting the company up for success. One thing that Antoine Martin said, I got to have you talk about, he said that, so you were incubating the company at Thrive. Obviously, then you kind of joined full-time as CEO. The cap tables typically look different based if someone incubates a company versus, you know, co-founders come together and then raise money. You did some interesting things during that transition with the cap table. What exactly was that? Yeah. So for your listeners, I'm generalizing, but essentially, if you think about it, one end of the spectrum is you and co-founders come up with an idea, build something, and then go fundraise. And the amount of equity you give up to investors there, or the, sorry, the amount of equity you get in that situation. And the, on the other end of the spectrum is an existing company hires you as an employee. Incubations were kind of right in between in terms of the equity that you get as a founder. Because there's a VC firm coming to you or someone coming to you and saying, hey, we have an idea. We fundraised. Now we just need founders. And so that was the situation with the browser company. And then out of nowhere, as I was leaving Thrive, very prematurely, very out of nowhere, point is a situation where if you're Thrive, you're probably, you should typically be pretty mad with me. Josh Kushner, the founder, came to me and said, you know what, we're giving you back double digit equity of Thrive's just because it feels like the right thing. Because if you had started this company with Hirsch and you had come into us with this idea, you would have owned this amount of the company. And it only feels right that you would own that amount of the company. I, I will never forget it because I wasn't even on my mind to, you know, ask. Because it, it wouldn't have been, it would have felt unfair for me to go to Thrive and say, hey, give me back that those shares. That that no, they no. And so it was it was quite a legendary move in my book to do that. I never asked for anything in return. There was no catch. 
He's never talked about it publicly. You know, it's just, it was just the right thing to do. So, or he thought it was the right thing. Yeah. I mean, it definitely stood out. Like if I'm, if I'm an investor, my general thinking is probably I'm trying to make as much money as I can. That's a very unintuitive thing. It's very bad for me, for my business to just give, sounds like a very large chunk of their stake, just give it away. So that says a lot. Yeah. I, I, I think at the same time, you know, if I, I think Josh did that because of his values and his kindness as a human. And I think that even if you put on a capitalist hat, I think Josh, I know Josh is building Thrive to be a long-term institution, an institution that is a larger deal when he's 80 as, as it is today. And if you think about it, I'm ta- we're talking about this on your podcast. We're talking about my, we're not going to talk about probably any of my other investors on this podcast. And I tell every founder that calls for a reference check on Thrive that story. And along the way, as you know, in every incremental fundraise round, there's a question of pro rata. There's a question of your inside investors. Like you better believe I feel loyalty to Thrive that I don't to everybody on our cap table. And you better believe that if I ever start another company, I will go to Thrive first because of the way they treated me. So again, I think Josh did it out of the kindness of his heart, but I also think it's a very true and savvy move if you think about the long-term kind of like loyalty and brand and trust that engenders. Yeah. Well, even in like the short term or the medium term, just so people understand if they, if they maybe don't quite fully get the situation, like why was that a good tactical thing to do? Like why did that set the company up for success versus Thrive just continuing to, to hold their stake? Let's keep the numbers simple. So these are fake numbers just to make a point. So let's say that Thrive gave us back 10% of the company. 10% of nothing is nothing. 10% of, let's say, the company sells for a billion dollars, what Instagram sold for, that's $100 million. And there's dilution, so maybe it's less, but let's just keep it simple. It's $100 million. So that's basically like Thrive said, here's $100 million back to you, founders, just because it's the right thing to do. By the way, it could be a lot more than that if the company is, you know, if it's, it sells for, well, what's up? So it's a billion dollars, more than a billion dollars. And so it was... A huge deal to me and Hirsch because we're even more incentivized to make this company succeed because it is tough. Like there are some dark days and existential days and days where you need that extra. I'm often feeling like really, you know, a true co-founder, full owner um, definitely pushes us through, which I think is part of what made it really savvy for Thrive and probably part of their motivation, which is like, look, wow, this is a tall task going against Alphabet, Microsoft, Apple. You know, we want Hirsch and, and Josh and the team in those days that it's tough to like, you know, really feel ownership of it. So I think it was really savvy of them, but, you know, nine out of 10 investors would not do that. 99 out of 100 would do that, I think. Yeah, it's, I'm not going to lie. I don't know if I could do that. You, you'd, like to, you'd like to think that you could, man, that's a, that's a bold move. So well, when you talk about dark days, you said COVID was scary. I mean, it was probably dark, certain parts of it for every startup, like, how did you go from starting COVID hits, launching? Like, can you just kind of take us inside what those next couple months were like? Yeah. So, I mean, COVID was every bit existential and discombobulating at a personal level, I think, at an emotional level, as for us as it was for anyone else. I think professionally, it was deeply inspiring. It was deeply clarifying. You know, there was sort of, it was almost this like refuge during the pandemic to kind of pour ourselves into the details of this prototyping. It was such a, what do we want to be when we grow up? What are we going to find around the corner? What is possible, period? You know, almost like the most fun period of a, of a company's life. And then at a time when everyone we were isolated with and catching up with, we're all lamenting, oh, I, I finally get why you wanted to quit your job to work on a web browser. Like, I hate my web browser. Like, we weren't getting that reaction before COVID. So, really? No, people were just like a desktop web browser. Like, what are you talking about? There, were, No one got it. No one got it. Truly, no one got it. And I think what I remember about that period was just trying, prototyping, and onboarding a person or two by hand every day on Zoom. Adina, especially on our team, like legitimately like walking people through how to use this thing because it was barely put together. It was just this, it was almost this, I think COVID brought the sense of we like, we have nothing to lose. Let's just go have fun with it and mess around. And that energy, I think, led to a lot of the kind of creative differences that you see in art today. But I think, yeah, I think there was something about that period that kind of gave us a like, 
just go for it energy that I think has persisted to this day. Um, and then I think, you know, I think unlike other companies, we sort of had, we were sort of always had a product out in the world since the first day, which is ironic because a lot of people like are defa- think of browser companies having this wait list. But the reason we had an actual wait list was only because, you know, we had to take things like security a lot more seriously in performance, et cetera, because we're a web browser. So it's really privileged access to your life and your information. And for, so for a bunch of reasons, we had, we had a wait list, but we were onboarding dozens and hundreds and thousands of people every week, pretty much in state one. And so I think, you know, COVID, the beginning of COVID, I think of this prototyping phase, and then it's just sort of a blur to where we are today with these milestones of like getting rid of the wait list or, you know, starting to go to Windows, but otherwise it's just been this kind of like gradual transition to where we are today. Yeah. I don't actually know if we've talked about this yet, but why a browser? And then what was the very first kind of thing that you launched? Like, I know it's kind of just like a little bit, like you didn't have a specific like product thesis. It was a little bit larger and a little bit maybe like abstract, but specifically why a browser? And then what was kind of the first thing you came out with? Yeah, it's it's what you said before, which is we just noticed that people in our lives, including us, were spending eight hours a day in web browsers. And Hirsch and I sold our first company to Facebook, where the main metric that everyone at the company obsessed over was time spent. And it was time spent because the company knew that whether it was you spending time with its products or distributing your attention to other products or other services, the most valuable thing you could get someone to do is vote with their time and give you their time. Now, Facebook used it in ways that we didn't necessarily feel great about uh, at the end of our tenure there, but we recognized that the value in that. And so when we saw these rectangles that everyone was spending eight hours a day in that hadn't changed in two decades, and then you learn the reason they hadn't changed their business model incentives from Google as related to search ads, it kind of had this one, two, three of, all right, I don't know what should come next, but I know that this is probably the greatest arbitrage in consumer software because no one thinks it's consumer software. And you spend more time in a web browser than any other piece of consumer software, as much as we're obsessing over messaging apps or social networks. Uh, hasn't changed in two decades, unlike consumer social, where there's a new app every month and there's like a really you know efficient market for competition and change. One of the reason it hasn't changed for two decades isn't for some structural natural law reason it's because google just makes a boatload of money and people think browsers are boring and they're really hard to build so no one's changed so it was actually a real leap of faith because we broke all of the startup rules which again goes back to what we started at the beginning with inversion so one of the reasons inversion is so core to our company is because the browser company approach itself was inverting what you're supposed to do we did not have a problem statement It was almost impossible to build an MVP because it's a web browser. It's a gnarly technical piece of software. So the company kind of broke the rules from day one, knowing that it may have been our demise and may still be our demise, who knows? But that that was the motivation was that's a lot of time. That's a lot. Even today, you know, someone sent me a screenshot of their screen time in in Mac OS settings. It was like, arc, 31 hours, 31.9 hours. Yeah, you know, and again, it's wow, but if you work on the internet, if your livelihood's on the internet and you work a 40, 50 hour a week, like kind of checks out, that's a lot of your waking hours in a web browser. That was really the fundamental observation. Yeah, and, and I think I've heard you mention this before where it's trying to get someone to try a new product. Like it's it's very, very difficult, especially if it kind of fits within the mold of existing rails and you kind of just built an entirely new set of rails. It's like, don't just change this one small behavior, shift your entire 40 hours a week of work, whatever, or 31 hours in the browser, shift it all over. And then it's not like you're trying to grab a certain workflow or a certain thread. It's like all of it. And it's a new operating system, it's like full control, full, full, like immersion, a lot you can do with it. Yeah, exactly. The, the the book would say what we should have done was we should have picked a very specific vertical like salespeople or engineers. And then we should have like cut out, like, you know, siphoned off one little part of their workflow. Uh, so code reviews. And then, you know, we should have built an MVP in the hackiest, quickest way to do it. Uh, a Chrome extension, not a full-fledged web browser placement for Chrome. And so we would have made a 
you know, a way for engineers to be 10x faster in their code reviews in the form of a Chrome extension. And by the way, that might be a really great company that probably would make a bunch of money. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm just saying that we broke the formula in, in, in all three of those ways and that we were, were for everybody. At least everyone whose livelihood is on the internet. We're going to fully, fully replace your default web browser. And it's going to take a long time to do that and build that. And we don't actually really know why you're going to like it or it's going to be better. But it's been a couple of decades since it's really changed. So I'm sure we can find some ideas along the way. Like kind of insane in retrospect now that I say it out loud. Yeah, like it's pretty, like I'm trying to think of why was the web browser just a, just like a rectangle thing that didn't change? It's probably just because the internet wasn't that fast, wasn't that powerful. You need to make it as simple as possible to just deliver text, basically, was what it was originally. Yeah, and actually, in fact, web, if you, if you were to go all the way, if you were to go back to, you know, for example, AOL, web browsers actually had a lot. You know, they used to have, they used to be, the, they were the original super app in many ways. You know, Mark Andreessen and his first web browser had a place where you could discover content. It was like a for you page for TikTok, uh, like way back. So like browsers have actually gotten less powerful over time in many ways as it relates to what you turn to a browser for and what it can do for you. Uh, the big shift, but the, the reason that it was it was a relatively simple rectangle at the time in which it really got popularized was because the web was, it was, you turned to it as a, a utility. It was not the main application or anywhere close on your computer. You went to it to quickly look up a piece of information on Google uh, or go to Yahoo or to a discussion board. It was like a very brief moment in your day, almost like a calculator app or a note-taking app. And so you didn't need it for that many things. And as you said, like you, your computer, you didn't even have tabs. Browsers didn't have tabs. We only go to one thing at a time because that's all a browser can handle. And then there were a couple kind of sea changing moments in a browser. But I see the big one that unlocked where we are today and why there's a moment for companies like ours is when web applications became things. So when, when the internet or the web shifted from kind of text-based media consumption environments to interactive applications, that weren't run on your desktop, they were run from the cloud. That's when web browsers had a sea change caused by Chrome. Because Chrome is the first browser that made using the internet really fast. If you use things like Google Docs or Facebook or anything that, I mean, really, basically everything you use today is a web application pretty much. And, and that, those didn't even ex really exist before a Chrome made them newly possible and fast. Now, the reason they haven't changed since then is because Chrome just cared about doing that. And they're only motivated to make browsers better so that you would end up doing more Google searches. And so they really view their product and, and, and you can see it in the product. It's basically one big, if you really like squint your eyes, Chrome just this really large search box at the top they call a URL bar, but basically just by default sends you to Google. That's true. And you think about what is probably the thing you do the most in Chrome, it's probably open a new tab that, just go, it's just, it's, it's a Google search. That's a pretty good workflow to capture. That was one of the really interesting things from our user research before we built a product is you talk to people about Chrome and say, Hey, explain to me your bookmarks. And most people actually don't have any bookmarks other than the defaults that they, you know, or their bookmarks are out of date. So they, they might have one that they click on, but they'd have seven or nine and they haven't, they're like, oh, I, I added that seven years ago when I was in college and I haven't cleaned it up. So. Really, really the default the behavior in Chrome is command T, command T, command T, new tab, new tab, new tab. At some point, kind of declare bankruptcy, open a new window, quit your browser, start over again. And that's kind of the behavior. And that's the behavior because that's what the product tells you to do. So I think one of the big things that people would probably describe the current product, like the current Arc browser, or maybe as, as it evolved over time, I think actually specifically, we'll talk about YouTube in a second, but there's one YouTube video where you're reacting to people reviewing the product and the guy reviewing it is like, it sorts my tabs nice and that's why I like it. <laughs> it's like, that's kind of a significant thing. But like, is, is that a big reason that people use it? Because it just like, it organizes the, the tabs? Like just for someone who's never used it before and unfamiliar. Yeah, honestly, Tony, this is the, the, this is, this is the question where some nights I'm like, we've invented the future and some nights I'm like, we have to start all over, it's all screwed because we have a very, very dedicated, passionate group of people that use our product. Our retention has been fantastic since day one. And nobody, including me, can describe why they like the product in a sentence that sounds compelling or coherent in any way. And the reason is, 
it's almost like if you think back to when you first used the iPhone, and I don't mean to compare Arc to the iPhone. Again, I just said this the whole thing may explode and maybe it's a sham. The comparison that I'm making though is that the iPhone was not a single feature. Again, breaking the rules. It was not a single feature that why the iPhone was better than my BlackBerry. It was all these little details and these little touches and these little innovations that added up to kind of a cohesive experience and made it better. And so the person that uh, primarily used their cell phone for work might have really liked the iPhone's dialer, whereas the person that was kind of in college and using BBM might have really liked the messaging experience and the chat bubbles and the green, you know, and the, and the colors and the keyboard. But it wasn't, it was different for each person, depending on how they use their cell phone, what they did for a living or their livelihood, how they spent their days, their sensibilities, but there's sort of something in there for everyone. And so, yes, some people would say, I love Arc because it makes me so organized and it cleans up my tabs and I got my folders and my spaces and my labels and I just feel so organized. Other people would say, I love Arc because I can go into this kind of no Chrome focus mode and fly around the internet with keyboard shortcuts and I feel super super fast and speed is the value prop. They have other people that are like, ah, it's like, it's just kind of prettier and more beautiful. And I tried it at some point. And now I like their split screen feature. So like split screen is pretty chill. And there's I just, I don't know, we don't know. So what we've kind of said so far is we've justified it as, well, look, our retention is fantastic. We have these really passionate people that use our product. We love using it every day. I guess marketing is going to be hard, but hopefully, you know, marketing was hard for the iPhone and Snapchat. And maybe one day we'll live up to the same category. And other days, it's like, this is all going to tumble because I still go to, you know, a party and someone's like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, I don't know. Don't ask me. Like, it's not interesting because I just don't know how to, I, I'm like a good, relatively good communicator. And I still do not know how to tell you what my product does. So good sign or bad sign. Yeah. I mean, you can maybe just say like, it's, yeah, I, I don't even know if this is true. An internet native web browser, which like it's, it's a better way to use the internet, but like, that's what a browser is. A browser is an internet. Like really, really successful angel investor in our cap table that runs one of the biggest companies in the tech industry. Uh, and they texted me the other day, like with this impassioned pitch for how we should be framing and mark positioning in the browser. And it was like, the way they talked about it was like, you know, if you're a knowledge worker that uses SaaS tools, like this is the browser for you. And it's like, and I get what they were going for. And like, I think they're right, but boy, does that not roll off the top. You know, <laughs> so, so I, I think what I would say is there's a certain type of person who's an art person, and it's probably the people that listen to this podcast in terms of what they do for a living and what, where on the internet they spend their time. But we don't have a single crisp value proposition like speed or organization or focus or beauty. We have a lot of, I think I'd like to think we have all of those and different people resonate with different parts of it, but it definitely makes it hard to market. People are really passionate. People are very passionate about art. And in a way that I think is odd for a browser as much as it benefits us. And I almost think it kind of comes from the mista, the fact it's kind of hard to explain. Almost, I think, to some extent, like engenders a little bit of like, we know the secret, like we're hard, you know. So I don't know. You could talk yourself in a circle about whether or not this is good or bad or, you know, what it means for the future. But yeah, when you, when you kind of think about, okay, it's Google's business model, can, they control the browser. I mean, you can argue that, whatever. Their business model is get you to click on ads. You obviously don't have that incentive. One of the questions that Lenny Rachitsky, I know you're on his podcast a couple months ago. Maybe a year ago, yeah, or so. Yeah. I asked him, I was like, what do you what do you wish you asked Josh? Or like, what's something I need to ask him? He's like, How are they gonna make money? And it seems like that seems to be like a common question from kind of like more of the like the investor community is like, how do you make money with this thing? How do you usually answer that question when people ask, or how do you think about it? And then maybe how does that flow into product decisions? Because it's so much different that you're kind of taking the anti-business model approach of kind of the incumbents. Yeah, it's so interesting. You're definitely, you've done your research because you're asking all of the questions that don't have easy answers. But because of who I know your audience of this podcast is, I'm going to give you the inside baseball, inside baseball answer. We've gone through a journey with this one because... The inside baseball answer is if you look at what where a web browser's enterprise value comes from, you and I guess what I mean by that to demystify that phrase, industry buzzword is why does a company like Apple, Microsoft, Google, why do they care about a web browser? What what strategic value does it provide them? You would you would simplify it down to the fact that everybody that uses a computer needs a web browser. 
So the addressable audience is pretty much everyone that needs the internet or uses the internet. That's an incredible TAM. Everyone. It is the largest TAM imaginable in terms of number of individuals. And then you were to say, okay, but everyone needs a notes app. Or a lot of people use notes apps. How long do people spend or what do people do in these web browsers that everyone in the world needs? Well, they spend 32 hours a week. They buy things. They research things. They make big life decisions in them. They do work. They do personal life. They do school. Actually, in fact, their entire lives are in these things. And so any, I don't mean this in a condescending way, but when you talk, well, we're like feeling our self angsty existential about our business model. When we go to interview people that have run browser companies or operate, you know, and, and understand this stuff, they go, what? Do not spend a second worrying about this. Web browsers are unbelievably lucrative and strategic. This is why they are all owned by the trillion dollar companies. Nobody is really wondering why browsers are valuable or how they can derive value. Every major business model in our industry passes through the through their web browser. Are you interested in fintech and payments and shopping and e-commerce? Guess where it all flows through? The web browser. You know, are you interested in SaaS and productivity? Guess where all those subscriptions and, and SaaS to what do you think people use Salesforce? Not on a local Mac application in the web browser. So the list goes on, my friend. Like, do not spend a second worrying about how a browser is valuable. Your existential question, the main thing you need to focus on is how do you get anyone to care? Because the way the browsers have grown historically has been through these inorganic artificial means that you do not have access to. You buy a MacBook, Safari comes pre-installed. You buy an iPhone, Safari comes pre-installed. You buy an Android phone, Chrome comes pre-installed. You buy a Microsoft or a Windows machine, Edge comes pre-installed. And so you can't do that. And the reason that you have to do that is because no one cares about their web browser. They don't think like that. No one gives a shit. So your big challenge is there is a air quote graveyard of startups that try to build web browsers with these really compelling pitches for the time. Remember Rockmilt, the social browser in the social era, there are many of these and they all end up plateauing because they can't figure out distribution and none of them go out of business because they can't figure out their business model. So that's, well, that's, that's the inside baseball true answer is our existential question, and every startup has one, is distribution. How do we get to scale you know, when we don't have the unfair advantages of, of browser companies yesteryear? On the other hand, we're definitely getting to the point as a company where I think it's hurting us uh, from our perspective of distribution and branding. That the fact that we are so anti-Google in many ways, we're putting ourselves as an inversion of the old internet dominated by Google. And, and saying we're an inversion because the way their business model gets in the way of your experience without saying what our business model is, is really hurting us at this point. So my answer is we will probably monetize this year in some form, not because we or I believe that is actually how most of that's not where most of our revenues can be generated these days, but just to put people at ease. that look, we're going to be able to at least cover our costs. So you can, you can extrapolate how this this may not be the most lucrative business you've ever seen, but I can believe they can keep the lights on if they do it this way. And so, but it's been this really tricky balance of, again, do we have a dinner party one sentence answer to this question versus what we believe the truth is? Because your previous question about why people love ARC, you know, there's the truth in the retention data and in the brand love and in the, you know, and then there's the, I still don't have a one sentence answer for you. And so the business model is another fantastic version of that question, which is, We've done our homework. It's not the most important question for us as a company right now, existentially or anytime soon. And people ask it a lot and deserve an answer and we don't have a crisp answer. So you really did hit on actually two of two of the like core themes for 2024 for the browser company. Yeah, I would kind of summarize it as your answer to the question is almost the economy runs on the internet and we are the way that people access the internet. If you're controlling how, or if you're, if you're someone's rails to participating in the economy, there are ways to make money. And I don't think you have to have that figured out yet. And then you layer in things like, you know, if you believe, I'm not, you know, everyone can have their own opinions, but for those that believe that AI and LLMs are going to transform software categories, guess where those are going to be distributed from for the foreseeable future? They're all in the web browser. They're all applications or Chrome extensions in the web browser. ChatGPT is a tab. You know, it's all, it all, it all comes, it all comes through the web. Doesn't even have to figure it out, but it's not, it's not, if, if this company fails, it won't be because we didn't figure out our business model.
Yeah. Well, so interesting story. I I think there's an interesting story here. I don't actually know it, but Antoine said, I got to ask you, Arc Search, it was very different 45 days before it launched to when it actually launched. What's the story there? Yes. The story of Arc Search was our team, one of the one one of the fun parts about working on a web browser is you use it every day. And so it's one of those you know rare products where you're spending all day using the product that you're building. And so you got to empathize with it or sympathize with the experience in a way that's pretty distinct from other, other software I've worked on. And the number one request from our team, going back to something we spoke about previously, was I want to use Arc on the weekend, on my phone, on vacation, you know. Or I just want my mobile web experience to be to have that same arc flair. And we kind of almost as like an end of year experiment, morale boost, just why not vibes. We took two people and gave them two months and said, okay, you can finally make a default web browser that our team's going to love it and people will love. But you have to have the world's most narrow focused value proposition. And then you've got to, alongside of it, try to do something so bold then we'll learn something about growth because we're in this period of focusing on scaling. It's almost like symbolically, all right, we'll finally do it, but keep it really tight and focused in there, uncomfortably narrow, and at least try some like really bold growth things so we can learn from it culturally. And what we started with was that first part, which was the original motivation. It's like, let's make the best default web browser and was focused on speed because on, on your phone, your web browser is the same thing as a search engine in a way it's not on desktop. It's basically a quick look up. You're hanging out with some friends, you want to know something, you open your browser, and really you open the search engine, hit enter, and then you get an answer. And so we, we started designing these little details, like we open the app, the keyboard's up by default, so you can just start typing. And we had these really like, you know, like flowy animations, and just try to make a really focused, fast way to look something up. But that was only the first part of the prompt, because that's not enough to get you to switch. And so one person on our team came up with this idea of, all right, it's a value prompt, the default mobile browser, the quick lookup tool was you just want to get an answer to something. On mobile, it's kind of, you got to fumble, like we added an ad blocker because the ads are annoying and a GDPR blocker because the pop-ups are annoying. But even after that, it's like, man, the websites themselves still kind of got to check a bunch of them a lot. You got to wade through SEO. And it's like, even if we remove the ads and we put the keyboard up, it still doesn't feel fast because the mobile web is just so hard to navigate on your phone and, and is so SEO optimized. And so someone on our team had this idea of, what if you just made the one perfect tap? You know, the, the like the most, when you're looking something up, when you want to know why, why they serve blueberry juice on Finnish air, which is an example I know I use too much. I need a new example. But it was like the, the first time I used this prototype, I was like, oh, I get it. Because I landed in Helsinki and I was like, why did this airline serve me free blueberry juice, but tea costs $6? And this prototype was like, I'm going to make you a web page with no SEO content after reading six that answers that question very precisely with some images. And I was like, this feels fast. Now I feel fast. It actually felt like that quintessential kind of 10X experience where up until that point, the Arc Search app just kind of felt like best default browser, but by 20%, like just barely. And, but it was, a, it was a very last minute addition. And then even from there, it was actually just like a, a qual, like a ranking quality tweak a week before we were set to release it actually made it good enough that I think it really sung. But it was a two month project, you know, two, two people worked on it full time, a couple of people part time at different ports. So a good lesson in just like having for us and having like a focused, actually the opposite of so much of what we spoke about so far, like very focused value prop, a very narrow build. So yeah, I guess we're a Frankenstein company, but one of our values is assume you don't know. And so we, we do always try to mix it up and, and challenge our assumptions. Yeah, I was gonna say last night. There's just there's this guy. He's this like really NBA or college basketball player. He's a sophomore, six foot ten, but he plays like a point guard. So he's a center that's really fast and can pass. And I was just like, who is this guy? I just I arc searched him, and I got like the full scoop from I think it summarized five different sites. And I was like, man, I probably just saved five minutes because I got it all, all the relevant stuff, and I didn't have to jump Wikipedia, ESPN. I know what he looks like. I didn't have to go to the images tab. Like it was, it was very elegantly laid out. And it was just, you, you're creating the new rails where people spend their time and you're saving them time too. And one of our, one of our best turner, by the way, is that if like, can we actually get people to start almost like Apple had its iPod moment. The Macintosh was actually a very niche computer. You know, it was not a huge, huge success relative to the PC. 
The thing that really catapulted Apple to the Apple that we think of today wasn't the iPhone, it was the iPod. The iPod was this very focused device that had actually Apple sensibility to its core. And then people started buying Macintosh computers so they wanted to connect the iPod because it worked really well with iTunes and iTunes worked best on Macintosh. It was like the original blue bubble. And so one of the ideas of Arc Search is can we make our iPod? Look, it's a, it's a tall task to ask you to switch this desktop Arc browser that no one can tell me what it's for. But yet everyone that uses it raves about it annoyingly. You know, so can we can we can we build this really focused mobile app that everyone can get and everyone be like, whoa, this is awesome. Feel that attention to craft and detail what's possible, and then hope, hey, you know, that 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 page you found about that NBA player or the college basketball player, like you want it on your desktop because you're about to roll up to your laptop, press this button and sync it to desktop. Wait, desktop? They have an arc browser? So in theory, that's how it should work. In practice, it might all explode, but no. So I think I, I kind of wanted to close the conversation on, it sounds like getting distribution, super important, high priority right now at Arc. It seems like one thing you guys, you guys have kind of cracked is this building in public concept. Um, and you've also done, it seems like a good job on YouTube, which is kind of a counterintuitive move in 2023 when you started doing it. Like not many people are doing that. Maybe that's why you did it. But how has it kind of been going and why are you doing it? The strategy behind it all? Yeah. So I think the origins of this were, in many ways, Browser Company is a reflection of PTSD that Hirsch and I have from things we messed up with our first company. And one of the things that I will say I messed up in our co-founder equation with the first company is I was really restless. I was really impatient. I was that kind of classic founder trope where it's like, it doesn't work in the first two weeks after launch. You think so. you like go on to the next idea. And really what you learn from people who have been successful is it's just kind of a relentless iteration, you know, grinding on the details until something really clicks. And these like 2% improvements of finding it better. But I was bad at that. And so the browser company in many ways are these almost like secular long-term bets where we say, here's where we think the world's going to go in five years. And it may seem really silly right now. And it may be really risky to guarantee our success at that time horizon. But like, let's just, let's just like, have conviction where the world's going. And so when we started to think about really not distribution, but how do we want to show up in the world from the perception of marketing, comms, PR, just traditional storytelling is what we call it, how you talk to the public. Well, we said, we kind of decided to make the secular bet that we think video is going to be the future. To us, see, that's the thing you said, it was kind of ahead of the curve, or I forget the way you phrased it, but to us, it was, of course, it's going to be video. You know, it's everywhere you look is video. And not only is it going to be video, it's going to be video on your computer or your internet connected device. And honestly, it's going to be on YouTube because TikTok is going to be a thing, but it really seems like YouTube is getting channels and it just, it was clear to us it was going to be video and it was going to be YouTube. And then if we focus on building and compounding our presence and distribution on YouTube with video, that would be a long-term bet, just like betting on the browser that we'd be happy that we made. Well, I was going to say, it's almost like you don't know what was going to work. You just knew five years looking back, oh, this was the right direction to go in. And it's just, how do you get there? And the wonderful thing about YouTube is you, you can see that in our videos. If you go back and look at the very first one, it was me on a summer vacation in front of my laptop, winging it, just talking to the camera. And then we start to do some like product tutorials with the tea. You can, you can actually see our live product iteration in the, in the video history up until this day. So there's this kind of like public record of that, not sure what this is for, figuring it out. And so that was the bet on the on the medium and the um, the distribution channel. And then from, okay, well, what sort of videos do we want to make? This was honestly less from a distribution perspective and more from a brand perspective than a trust perspective, which was uh, technology companies don't have the best brands. Like people kind of are skeptical of them these days and they, they don't really want to believe. Uh, and for really good reasons that we all relate to. And so, you know, Given what's happened the past decade or two in public sentiment, we said, like, okay, what would make us really trust a company with 31 hours of our time? We're, we're, we're making payments in it. We're looking at vulnerable questions. And to us, it's like, well, everyone's imperfect. Like that, and everyone, the, like, you kind of can't trust anyone in some respects. So you have to believe that everyone's going to make mistakes and every company's going to make mistakes. But if we knew the integrity of the people, if we knew the values of the people, I felt like we knew them. So it's not a perfect analogy to a company, but the goal with YouTube and building in public, as you say, was if people can get to know us as humans or try to, and we can try to be as authentic and open as possible, 
by all means, like we're not perfect and we were going to regret it at some point because we said something in the wrong way. But for people that really follow along or the corpus of the videos we put out, we believe like I have this, this cheesy sticker on my desk says the truth will set you free. It's like a fortune cookie, I know, but it's just really, it, I always turn to it and it's, I think we are who we are. I'd like to think we are well-meaning, good individuals at this company that are really trying our best for the right reasons. And I know we'll screw up, but if we can really put out authentically who we are and we think the truth is good, then it's also a bet that in moments where we need a little of that trust, we need a little bit of that generosity, it will show up. And I think one of those actually happened recently with Arc Search, where the Arc Search app and the phenomena like really ticked off a lot of people who don't, you know, especially in the publisher world that don't know the company or have that trust with the company. And I was really, by the way, and I think they were valid in a lot of ways. They brought up these really philosophical points that, like I've been grappling with and honestly hadn't thought about as much as I should have. But I was also really touched by the way in which our members and the people who use our product really had our back and not had our back in that they, again, themselves didn't agree with the criticism or were like reply boys, you know, like, you know, just angrily you know, you know, at replying these. That's not what I'm saying. But there was just this level of, okay, you know, there was just this level of like no reaction in some ways from the people who use our product that was interesting in, in, in relation to the kind of controversy in at least some corners of the internet. And to me, at least the narrative I've told myself is that's a reflection. I think people that have been following along know that we're trying really hard to do the right thing. And this is a moment where some people may think we, we, we miss the mark in certain ways, but I think there's some embedded trust through things like the videos that our hearts and intentions are in the right place, even if everyone's going to get it wrong in some moments. Yeah. And talking about just authenticity and, and trust, one thing I think you do really good tying back to team building is I've just noticed you do a very good job, like as the as a as a company as a whole, but even like as the CEO, praising the team. Like I just notice you elevate the people who contributed to certain things and give them credit publicly. I feel like a lot of founders, it's something that we could all do better. I mean, I, anyone can do that better. It's praising the team. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. And again, it comes from me messing that up the first company. I think with the first company I had watched the social network and, you know, I had this kind of, I don't want to say God complex and people that knew me at that time say I give myself too hard at the time, but I think on the spectrum of things, I saw myself as this like founder CEO. And again, you learn that for a bunch of reasons, that's just not true. That's not how the world works. It's not a good look. And it's, but more importantly, it's just like not how the things are built. I do very little at the browser companies. So like when people like Arc Search, I do very little on that. So it's like, to me, you end up, again, if, if you're in the same part, of me in this company that is willing to say like, yeah, I'm not good at that thing. I need to compensate and delegate. It's that part of it that says like, if someone's asking me about Arc Search or I'm talking about Arc Search, how could I not give credit to the people that actually built it, which are not me? So I, I appreciate it, but I also feel like it's a, uh, if anything, it's one of those like, again, to the like, of course, YouTube and video is where you should go, you know, in the moment and, and feeling that dissonance, there's sort of a like, why would I not? tag the people that built the thing that I'm talking about instead of taking credit myself when I didn't do anything. So yeah, again, probably learning from my immature 20 year old self. Yeah, I really respect it. I like, I think it's a good strategy and it's, it's, it's interesting as a VC, right? I should be, my job is I, I take credit. Like that's what the VCs do. It's like, here, look how amazing I am. Everything I touch and invest in turns to gold. So it's like, it's really hard like navigating that as someone who I'm probably like you, like I'm, I'm pretty bad at taking credit for those things, but that's kind of what I'm supposed to do as a VC. So it's like kind of trying to find what's the happy medium. So I like the strategy. In the spirit of that, I would love to end this with a shout out to one person who it sounds like you spoke to about this podcast, Freya. And one of the best hires I've ever made in my career, and one of the most special people I've ever worked with in my career, was our first design hire, a gentleman by the name of Nate Parent. And Nate had... Uh, was someone we hired to be a first designer. I'd never been a designer before. And we hired him because Freya one day, because I was trying to recruit Freya, and Freya one day was like, I don't want to work on your dumb browser project, but there is this person named Nate Parrott who is the most creative person I've maybe ever met. And he just like builds web browsers for fun on the side. Like, do you want to meet him? And I met Nate and just kind of like Josh Leo, it's just flabbergasted by by him and his creativity and his authenticity the first time I met him. And uh, he's actually the person that uh, came up with the browse for me feature in Arc Search that we spoke about earlier when I was sitting on the plane 
in Finland and was like, why is this blueberry juice here? And I, I was wowed. It was because Nate came up with that idea. So not only credit to Nate for uh, the feature that you loved using with a basketball player, but shout out to Freya for introducing me to Nate in like week three of the company and really changing my trajectory forever. So thank you, Priya. I think that's actually how I first found the browser company too, was I had, I think I followed Nate on Twitter because he was a designer or PM or wh whatever at Snapchat for a very long time. Oh no, he's a uh, prototyping engineer. Okay. So th that, that's kind of how I became familiar with the browser company in the first place was from the team. So talk about distribution. There's different ways to do it. Well, this is an awesome conversation. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Tim. It was great. Thank you for listening to The Peel. If you don't want to miss future episodes, subscribe to my newsletter, The Split, in the show notes, and you'll get new episodes plus transcript in your inbox every week. If you want to support the show, share this episode with a founder who's trying to hire the world's greatest team. Thanks again to Josh for coming on. Make sure to check out ARC and the browser company in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. See you in the next episode.